can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See lights like a beach if you find the same right now. I'm feeling like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. Today is no different. I have Phil Hayde of PublicInc.com. And Phil, before I formally introduce you, I always like to point out other episodes people should check out of the podcast. Since you know, we're going to have a lot of you know conversation on social change, social issues, and really Phil helps companies bring that to light. Um, I had the founder of TerraCycle on, um, which was a fantastic episode um, talking about how do you not only eliminate waste, but not start creating, create more waste. And that that was a fantastic episode um, to check out. Um, Just a various, um, Chris Atageka, who started a couple nonprofits, um, he just had an incredible story of how he came from his background to the US, ended up getting his PhD, came from very humble beginnings. So uh, check that episode out with Chris Atigeka. It's one of my favorites over the past decade. Um, that and many more on inspiredinsider.com. And this episode is brought to you by Rise25. At Rise25, we help businesses give to and connect to their Dream 100 relationships and partnerships. And how do we do that? We actually help you run your podcast. We're an easy button for a company to launch and run a podcast. We do the full strategy, accountability, and full execution. You know, Phil, we call ourselves the magic elves to work in the background and make it look easy for the company and the host so they can build relationships, make great content, and run their business and not to do anything else. So, I mean, the number one thing in my life is relationships. I'm always looking at ways to give to my best relationships. And I found no better way over the past decade to profile the people and companies I most admire and share with the world what they're working on. So if you've thought about podcasting, you should. If you have questions, go to rise25.com or email us, support at rise25.com. We're happy to answer any of your questions. We have lots of free resources as well. So check it out. Um, I'm excited to introduce Phil Haid. He's the founder and CEO of Public Inc. And he started the social impact agency back in 2008 to change the way companies behaved in the world. And he set out to prove Profit and purpose can go hand in hand. They've worked with some amazing companies like Johnson and Johnson and many more. And Phil, thanks for joining me. Thanks so much. Great to be here. So just talk for a second. Um, I explained a little bit, but um, what does Public Inc. do? Yeah, so we are we we describe ourselves as an impact agency. So we really are this hybrid of you know, impact strategist consultancy meets creative agency. And that's very intentional because what we're trying to do in the world is to accelerate change and to really, as you just said, Jeremy, like to really prove this idea that you, if you embed social environmental impact into your business, you can be more profitable or as profitable as well as creating more social environmental impact. And so, you know, that idea has a lot more currency today. But when, when I started the company in 2008, that I did not have a lot of currency. And so what we really try to do, um, and we're part of the B Core movement, is to really help businesses be a better force for good in the world. And that means we have to figure out how you integrate the societal benefit into the business strategy in order for them to meet, you know, especially if you're a publicly traded company, in order to meet your financial results while also doing great things for, for your people and for the planet. And so that work is, you know, helping define your purpose. It's helping companies think about their ESG platforms. It's looking at their sustainability marketing. We're, we're marketers. We put that lens on it. Uh, it's creating campaigns and it's engaging audience and taking actions that move the world forward. There's so many benefits to that, obviously, from the consumer standpoint, also from a staff standpoint, they feel like, you know, I'm working with a company that has um, just, I have a greater purpose, right? Um, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about how do you, have you seen companies successfully integrate social impact? Because anyone listening right now is founder, CEO, or they're in the business world and maybe they're thinking, you know, maybe I'm doing it, maybe I'm not doing it, maybe I should be doing more of it. What has been successful that you've seen of how they, companies have integrated social impact in their business? Yeah, so where I would start with that's a great question. Where I would start is you need to ask yourself, what kind of business are you, right? Because 
there are certain businesses, and I'll give you some concrete examples, who are purpose-driven at their core. They were created to actually tackle a societal issue through a business modality, right? Um, we're working with Rivian, the electric car company. And if you listen to RJ Scarage, the CEO and founder of, of Rivian, who's, who's, and he's incredible, and his team is incredible, uh, and I'm not just saying that because they're our client, they really are exceptional, uh, talented people. He created this company to, uh, sorry, before he even got into cars, he said, I want to do something to tackle what's happening around the world and the planet. Uh, and decided to like to tackle the car industry. I mean, it's you know one of the hardest industries to crack into. Um, he they are purpose driven at their core. So I'll, I'll come back to what you to directly answer your question. But I think it's important to start to say, where are you on a spectrum? Are you purpose driven at your core, or are you just a great company who's trying to deliver a great product or service, and you care about your people and you care about being a good you know citizen of the world? Um, that that matters a whole lot. Because if you are purpose driven at your core, then your you know why you exist and that purpose idea has to flow through absolutely everything you do, right? And so when you look at um, and you think about your brand and how you articulate your brand, like all of it has to deliver. So all of your policies for your people, from recruitment to retention, right? All of the ways in which you produce your product, right? So you have to look at you know from a life cycle analysis and so on. All of it has to be fully, fully integrated. But there's lots of companies and people who listen to your podcast, right, who aren't there, but still want to do it. So there, the important thing is, is to, to get clarity on why you exist and then really think about what can we do? And, you know, through that sort of lens of ESG, environmental social governance, what are the core things that we can do that are good for our business and good for our people and good for the planet and get real clarity and structure around actions, commitments that you're going to take. And so you always need to look at it through this lens of, does this make sense for our business? Do we have a right to be doing this? Um, and so really how, what we try to do is help companies is to map out, you know, where you, why you exist, what you do, what is important in the communities in which you live in, both from an internal and external, and then start to map out, like you can only do so many things. So what are the key things you're going to do that are actually good for your business and good for community, good for planet. Um, and any company, quite frankly, can do that. Any company. Uh, but you have to take an inventory of what's important to you, what are your values, what makes sense for your business. And then, depending on why, you know, what are the core motivations, for some, it's about differentiation. Like they see this as an opportunity. If you're in a highly competitive, um, your product is a commodity, then differentiation is critical. So how do you stand out? What is it if you're leaning into your sustainability that would be differentiated for you? So asking questions about what's differentiated, what is authentic to us, right? What can we credibly do that would be additive? Like all those key questions is how you have to map um, this work forward to achieve profit with purpose. What are some examples of companies that are doing this well? I don't know when you say that for some reason, um, Bomba sticks out to me. I don't know why that, that comes up. What, what examples stick out to you? For sure. So on the purpose side, you know, I mentioned Rivian. Bombas is a great example. You know, the one that always gets held up because they've been so, they've been such a leader for so long, of course, is Patagonia, right? Purpose at their core. But there's so many companies now who are, you know, who are truly purpose at the core. I'm having an interesting conversation. This is a Canadian brand, but called Earth Own. So in the plant-based, so these are plant-based milks and right um oat milk and and uh, almond milk etc you know their whole reason for being is to accelerate a plant-based movement right and there's a ton of those in the food category in the clothing category which is you know which is challenging because you know the stat that horrifies everyone is like 15 percent of all of our apparel gets recycled which means 85 percent is ending up in landfill right so hard is an apparel company clothing company to but there's, there are laws. Eileen Fisher, I think, is a great example of a very, very sustainable, purpose-driven company. So there's a ton. I, mean, I could give you a whole list. There's a whole ton on there. But then there's other companies who I would say aren't like you wouldn't think as purpose-led. I'll give you a big blue chip. I mean, Microsoft, as an example, is, you know, if you look at what they're doing from a sustainability perspective and the ambition they have around it, particularly around being net zero, 
And, and they're, and what they're trying to do is actually go back to the beginning of when they were producing carbon and eliminate that. Right. But they've got big ambitions um, on from cybersecurity to, to environment. And the same thing is true of IBM, uh, you know, a, a longstanding blue chip company you wouldn't think, but isn't purpose driven at their core in the way that we're talking about it, but is doing, you know, is doing great things. So it just depends on where you are. A lot of the food companies, uh, Danon, uh, you know, is also now the biggest B core. I think they're doing very good work, very, very committed. Um, but, you know, we could go through industry by industry uh, from those that are purpose driven to those that are like maybe more the traditional that are that are coming um, and that are trying to become much more sustainable. When people come to you, for what are they asking? Right? It's like someone like, like you said, um, some people say, oh, maybe it's easy. Microsoft's huge, IBM's huge. Sometimes arguably that's tougher in a huge organization to when it's not maybe from the beginning, like you said, purpose-driven at its core to change course on a bunch of things. What When someone comes to you, a company, and, and it seems like you work with which larger size companies, so you can, you can talk about that, but what are they asking you? Yeah, so uh, they're asking a few different things. So we have some companies who come to us and say, help us kind of, refined our purpose. Uh, Tiffany & Co. Uh, in the U.S., we worked with them to kind of identify, this is before the sale you know, to LVMH, to define their purpose as a company. Um, and so there, and, and the question is, well, why? Why do that? Well, it's partly to actually start to make sense of all the things that they are doing from a sustainability lens, right? Um, so we have some companies who, who come for that. We have a lot of companies today who come to us um, through, and you know, we could get into this if it's of interest later, you know, the whole debate around ESG, but they come, they say like, we do all this stuff, but it's not coordinated. It's not aligned, right? We don't communicate it particularly effectively and we're not, we don't stand out. And so a lot of companies, you know, we work with is to organize and align all of their, you know, ESG efforts. So basically how do you position it? What, what connects all the things you're doing? How do you, you know, structure it and frame it? And then how do you start to communicate it uh, and activate it both internally and externally? So we do a, lo a lot of that. We have other companies. And so that's, you know, we're doing it for big, big bank, RBC at the moment. Um, but we do it for, you know, all kinds. We're doing it for telcos. The, the list goes on. A lot of companies also come with just a specific need around a campaign, right? We need to, you know, we want to advance this issue where, you know, you think of like a dog who's been in the space forever with real beauty. But lots of companies who have issues that they've been working on, but they realize they need to like, they need to elevate it, right? Or they've got a commitment. We're working, this is a Canadian brand called Shoppers Drug Mart. And they've had a foundation for many years. They supported women's causes. They needed more focus. And we helped them actually develop a focus around women's health equity, actually addressing the inequities that women face um, in terms of health outcomes, right? So as an example, I mean, Black women have worse health outcomes as it relates to breast cancer, right, and heart disease than, than other population sets. And so that, that's, that's a problem. And so they're actually committed to it. And so we, we created a strategy around it, but then we actually have to bring that out to the world. And so the campaign uh, we created for them is called, you know, Make Women's Health Visible, because so much of the problem is that the research is done on men. It's not done on women. There's not the same amount of resources that go into it. So companies are coming because they're trying to navigate and figure out how to either better communicate or how to have more impact in a community. And they don't know how to do it in a really measurable, um, effective way that will drive both like brand marketing measurement outcomes, but also societal outcomes. And so what we've become very adept at doing is helping them navigate the the challenges, right, around these issues, because everyone's scared to step in it, you know, more today than ever before. They're so worried that if they come out with something and they get criticized, um, that it's going to shut it down immediately. So how do you do something substantive that will also drive, you know, actual marketing or other business metrics in a way that will be truly also impactful, not just not just awareness, but actually moving issue forward? What is the the end result that you know you probably have a lot of background and research and discovery and things to come to? Then, what does it look like on the other side um, once yeah. you once you do all that? 
Yeah. So in some cases, it's uh, depending on the ask, it could be a community, like a community strategy. Like, so I mentioned Shoppers Drug Mart. Um, you know, right now we're working with Crocs globally on helping them think about their whole uh, strategy. Um, and so what ends up being is, okay, where are you going to focus and, and actually communicate, right? Like if it's a foundation or if it's just an extension, you know, what's the idea and how do you bring it to market? So, and who are you going to partner with and who are you going to, how do you engage your customer in it? So one of the end products is a, what we call a community impact program, right? Um, you know, it could be a signature program. If you're familiar with REI, they have opt outside, right? Which is sort of a, you know, they took a page out of Patagonia's book and they close their, you know, they close their doors on the Black Friday weekend around Thanksgiving, right? To get people outside, to get their, and started with their employees and now their customers. Um, so it could be like a signature program. Um, it could be a campaign where you're trying to get a customer to engage. It, it could be something where you're driving both buy this product and we're going to make X happen. But we try to move away from just the transactional to actually something much more sustaining and long-term. Um, but it usually shows up in a campaign, in a program, in an initiative, um, and in some cases, you know, literally it could be a, uh, it could be a, a statement or a, a stance that CEO takes on an issue, right? And it's more on the communication side, but it's really sort of planting a flag and saying, you know, like many brands have done, you know, if you think about Tom's and they've taken stances on gun control, right? Levi's has done the same thing, you know, using the voice of your CEO. So how do you leverage um, senior executives to get out there and champion issues, right? So it could be a piece of communications. It could be a program. It could be a campaign. Um, it could be, this is less sexy, but it could be a framework. Like when I talk about the ESG work, like we actually help them organize everything that they're doing in a way that they can now set measurable goals against it and communicate it to internal and external audiences in a, in a cohesive way. What are some best practices to communicate that back to the company and the people because you create this amazing body of work, this framework, and now they're like, Phil, I have a thousand staff members. Now, how do I get this back so they're all rowing in the same direction? Yeah. So there's a there's a bunch. Um, one that I think uh is what a lot of companies don't do, which gets them in hot water, is specificity. So a whole bunch of the pushback on greenwashing is that people are, you know, companies are making claims that they can't back up, right? And so when you just start talking about, you know, we're going to better the world and you don't actually have any specific example of not just a commitment that you're making, but actual like actions, right? Um, people call BS on that. They're like, well, that's not. And so now we're seeing like in Europe, like, I mean, they're, they're regulating against it, right? It's, it's, so one of the really important principles is, and we always say this, specificity is your friend, right? There's power in being really clear about what you are concretely doing to advance an issue. If it's, if you're talking about diversity, equity, inclusion in the workplace, what are you doing to actually make it more diverse, more inclusive, right? More equitable. So specificity is one. I think one that lots of companies struggle with, this, another one is transparency, right? Easy to say, hard to do. But because there is so much cynicism and skepticism out there today, and you see things like there's been this brand study that's been done for years where the stat that always sticks with me is like consumers, like 90% or 85% of consumers say that if a brand just this, you know, your brand disappeared tomorrow, they wouldn't care, right? So, and, and, you know, brands are always measuring, you know, uh, brand love. They're looking at how much people care about you know what what they stand for. So transparency is critical because when you can demonstrate where you are on the journey, nobody expects perfection, right? And we always you know that expression like don't let perfection be the enemy of good. No consumer, I shouldn't say no, but the vast majority of consumers we've seen this practically, and I've seen it in research. Do not expect companies and executives to be absolutely buttoned up and perfect, not at all. But what they will call them out in a nanosecond is if they are not being transparent about what they are doing or what they haven't achieved. So what we advise all the time is to say, let's set a path, let's set a map of where you're trying to get to, be really clear on where you are today and what the delta looks like, the gap between where you are and where you wanna to get to, and be very 
specific about the things that you're doing and just really transparent about where you are in that journey. I think Unilever has done a very good job of that over the years where they've got their you know, you know, sustainable living plan and they're very clear about where they are on that, on that, um, on that journey. And, and look, and the yardsticks will always change, but that transparency is critical. So specificity is critical. Transparency is critical. And then I think the maybe the sort of slightly softer one, but really, really important is I don't think companies, when we try to advise them, I don't think brands spend enough time thinking about what is their true, unique, uh, differentiated point of difference. Like what and what's your, so what is your perspective, your point of view that is unique into the market? And then really stick with that, right? Like you can't, you can't be fair weather on that. And so, you know, when you look at Nike, you know, and, and the very intentional calculated move they made with, you know, when they did the, the campaign with Colin Kaepernick a few years ago, right? They knew they would lose some, some customers as a result of it, but they also knew they would gain a whole lot more. And, and the reason that that worked so well was it was incredibly authentic to, I believe, who they are, right? It was just great, great marketing, and there was substance behind it. And so it's really important to have a point of view and to be able to be differentiated in that point of view and put that out in the marketplace. And then you got to stick with it, which I would say maybe is the last one I'll just highlight. It's really important. This is, this is a long game, not a short game. And any, and any company that is trying to create the quick win and, and then will get out and not stick with it is going to get punished in, in the short term and definitely in the long term. So yeah, you have to stick with the things you believe, which is why your values and your purpose are so important because those should not be things that you're changing on a weekly or monthly or annual basis. And we've seen that happen with people, companies putting it out and then not sticking with it and they get punished afterwards. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, the, you know, what most recently, right. If you think about the whole Budweiser and the Dylan Mulvaney scandal for the, you know, for people who know about it, basically a, uh, a transgender uh, influencer um, and, you know, Budweiser has had a strategy of reaching out to a variety of different communities and supporting communities. And I think that was, I think that's authentic from what I can, what I can see from the outside. And so uh, to Mark, uh, they sent a Dylan a can of Budweiser, Bud Light, with, with their picture on it. It was never meant to sell. They weren't selling the, the beer, right? But of course, Dylan put it on, on uh, social and it blew up where the, the, you know, the Trumpian GOP uh, it went crazy, ballistic, right? And they're gonna they're gonna boycott uh, Budweiser. The the mistake that Bud made was they did not stick with it. They didn't in, in that moment. They could have you know they they basically said we apologize. We didn't mean mean to make any huge divisive action. That's what the CEO came out and said. Which you know all that says to you is you don't really believe in it. If they had come out and said, listen, we support transgender, right? It is it's. There is, needs to be a place for that in our society today. And we know that a lot of our customers may not agree with that, but we as a company absolutely support people, right? LGBTQ plus, and we stand by what we did. If they had done that, this, the narrative would have been completely different, but that's not what they did. So then people question, well, you actually, so now this is just a stunt, right? This is performative. And one of the things we've seen in society over the last few years is, you cannot be performative anymore. The moment you're trying to just show your support for something where there isn't substance beneath it and there isn't true value-based alignment where you'll stick with it, you get skewered because there are so many cynics and skeptics out there, but because of the echo chamber you can create in social media, you have to be authentic. And that was an example where they, where they really weren't. Well, talk about why you started this company. What made you start this company? I don't know, when I hear you talk, I'm like, he could be a director of a huge nonprofit somewhere or why did you start? What made you start the company? So, um, you know, my, I've always been interested in social change. Um, I joke that, you know, it, it shows me I didn't choose it. It's sort of a nature thing. You know, if I love cars, I would have been working in the automotive industry. Um, and my, so my trajectory has always been sort of in the social change space. It, you know, it, around 2000, I was working, I fell into actually a uh, social issue advertising agency, which was so far from what I did before. I mean, I worked at a think tank on public policy. I mean, I, you know, very far from it. Um, but I was really intrigued. This is like 2000. And I was really intrigued by the work they were doing in corporate social responsibility, which was like a big buzzword 
back in 2000. And I was this idea that companies could do things in the space that were more substantive than just writing a check really, really intrigued me. And so I joined this company. Um, and probably around 2004, what I started to see, so we were developing CSR programs for all you know, beer companies, insurance companies, the like. And what I started to see was that no matter how successful we were, they wouldn't put more money against their CSR initiatives because it was seen as an expense to the business. It wasn't something that drove the business. They felt good about it, but it didn't drive the business. So I'd say probably around 2004, the sort of the, you know, the penny dropped for me. And I thought, this can't be the way forward because I was having a conversation with someone at one of the big banks and we were talking about what we had created. And we very naively said to them, you know, this is, we're so excited about what we've created together. Let's talk about how we 2X the budget next year, right? And the person looked at us and said, well, we can't do that for the reasons I've just explained, right? It was a cost of the business. And for me, that's when the light bulb went on. I thought this can't be the way. If we don't actually show them how this drives tangible business results, they will never put more money into it. And the problem with philanthropy, I love philanthropy, don't get me wrong, but the challenge with philanthropy is it doesn't scale. Right? And the number that I always proselytize in presentations and the like is that if you take all of the giving in the U.S. on an annual basis, you're talking, depends on the year, but you're talking between $400 and $500 billion, right? which sounds like a huge sum of money. But it costs, that is less than what it costs to educate kindergarten to grade 12 for one year in the United States. So philanthropy is a really important piece of the puzzle, but it cannot be the solution. So which means, coming full circle to your question, for me, why I started public was probably 2004, it started to ruminate. And I'm like, we have to prove that companies, if they think of social environmental impact as a business advantage and a business strategy, I want to prove that they can make as much money or more money and create more good, not less. And so that's why uh, in 2008, I, I, you know, I went off with a business partner at the time. Um, and we created this company to prove this idea of profit with purpose, which wasn't a term that people were talking about in 2008. Today they do, but it was, it was to really go and prove that. Could this be the way forward? How do we accelerate? You know, there's all kinds of language, right? Jeremy, like there's stakeholder capitalism, conscious capitalism, like there's all these different terminology. They're all about the same idea, which is how do you actually create an economy using economics, using business practice? to create a world that is more sustainable, more just, more equitable, right? And if you don't use market force to do that, you'll never get scale. And so that's why I created the company was to be a part of that and to try to accelerate that, you know, through this sort of marketing, you know, uh, communications lens. How did you get your first clients? I mean, you've at this point served some really large clients. I imagine uh, like when you hung out your shingle, I don't know if you were... Uh, Going to Johnson and Johnson and say, "Hey, do you want some help?" But how did you get your first clients? Um, it's a great question. So in the early days, um, I would say more of my relationship and network was actually with nonprofits. Than you know, we worked. I worked with a bunch of companies, but my network was much much broader in the nonprofit space. And so in the early days, most of our clients were nonprofit, and we were sort of doing the flip side of the coin. We were doing the um, we would say to like nonprofits, don't separate money from mission. So let's think about how we can create public education campaigns, advocacy campaigns, uh, fundraising campaigns that will make you money, you know, generate revenue and advance your, your issue. But which was great and it was fun. Um, and I loved working with them and I loved the issues, but it was improving our thesis. Um, and to be honest, you know, I just chipped away at it. I mean, I, the amount of conversations I had and the, the really tough part was tough and exciting was I would go to these execs when I would get meetings with senior execs and companies. And we would talk about this thesis. This is in 2009, talk about profit with purpose. The response that we would get was either, I think this is just wrong. You shouldn't be, pro you shouldn't profit by doing something good. Right. So like a, a category, categorical rejection of the thesis got a lot of the, hey, that's really intriguing, but that's a nice to do, not a need to do. And I've got a whole bunch of KPIs I've got to achieve. And then there were others who would say, you know, I really think you're onto something, but I could never be perceived to say that in the market. And so I would say the first five to seven years, 
I, I can't even count how many conversations I had with senior execs trying to convince them of this thesis. And of course, you know, it's the old adage of like when you're breaking into the marketplace as a young employee, right? You don't have experience if someone won't give you a, a chance. And so we kind of cut our teeth on the nonprofit and then just chipped away, just chipped away, chipped away at getting, you know, we, early on, we got Starbucks in the US hired us to help them map their global volunteerism platform. And then we try to parlay that into another opportunity, you know, but it honestly, it took the market catching up to the idea to really get traction uh, in Canada. Maple Leaf Foods was a, a brand early on that took a bet on us, which was amazing. And then we just try to parlay that into others. You know, as you say today, it's, we work with huge blue chip um, companies, but it's, it's because I guess two things. One is that we stuck with it. You know, when I get asked by like social entrepreneurs, um, when I meet with them, they're like, well, how did you, you know, how, how have you been able to grow? You know, half of what I always say is how badly do you want it? Because there were a lot of tough years, but really, really, really believed in the thesis um, really wanted to prove it and just being really stubborn and loving what we were doing and just thought, I'm just going to stick with it. But, you know, that's 90% is the effort, right? How badly do you want it? Cause someone, someone's willing to work harder than you. So how badly do you believe in what you're doing and, and do you have the expertise to do it? But it was just, just hard work determination. And then you just build, you know, you build on one little success to a, to a second and a third. I mean, I could see, you're, I mean, you could have listened to the market at the time and be like, listen, we're just going to specialize in nonprofits and yeah. just gone down that route, listened to the market and done that. Um, right. But you had this underlying belief. So I guess you just kept trucking along and you had some breakthroughs um, with Starbucks and like you parlay, like you said, you parlay those to the next thing. You, you have now some social proof there, like, hey, here are these companies and it finally caught up. Yeah, exactly. It was like, you know, we got a uh, maple leaf food, we got a body shop, you know, so you get like a, one of the original, you know, as my kids call it, the OG in the social purpose uh, business, you know, so we get the body shop and, you know, look, success begets success. And when you show that you can actually deliver something of value, then you can, you can parlay that. But yeah, a big part of it was believing in it and letting, and letting the market catch up to us. Um, but you know, my wife jokes, it's like, I just, to me, it's, you know, no is not always no, it's just no is not, not, not now. Right. And I, I also joke, I say, you know, one of the differences between Canadians and Americans, uh, and I say, this is a very proud Canadian, but I love working in the U S because so often the Canadian, maybe you get a Canadian, maybe really means no, they're just too polite to tell you that it's a no. And, and so I always love, I always say to everyone, I love a yes. And I love a no, a fast no, but a maybe that's really a no is a terrible answer, you know, and, you, you know, nobody owes you anything, but they do. But I do believe we owe each other is always to be honest and be direct and be transparent about it. So someone doesn't want, you know, doesn't want your business. They can just say it. They don't owe you. You don't have to give you business, but to string someone along. So, you know, you just uh, you just persevere. Uh, and I think how badly you want something really, really determines success. Some of the evolution of your company, uh, we'll fast forward to today, um, which is navigating a um, virtual culture, right? Yeah. And so I'd love to hear what you do to maintain, help maintain, you know, again, the, your your core is helping people with these social issues and which are going to get promoted into their culture. And that's ultimately why consumers are going to buy. That's why people stay sometimes. Yeah. What do you do to maintain a culture in this remote world for your team? Yeah, it's a great question. And it's really hard. I will just say off the top that um, we're still trying to figure it out. And we've gone through different iterations because during, during COVID, um, you know, we, our policy was you do you. And so it was complete flexibility and people decided. And I think a lot of companies did that. Um, and now we're, you know, we've asked people to be in the office one day a week all together because I really believe it's really important to have face time and build uh, those trusting relationships. But in terms of the culture and how we navigate it, um, it's a work in progress for sure. A couple of things that we, we have done. 
One is that we, and I would highly encourage people to think about this. We worked with a great, a great firm, uh, Performance by Design, to help us with this, which is we built a code for public. Uh, and so a code is really how, you know, it is, a, it's your, it's your purpose, it's your values, it's your behaviors in one small tight box, right, that everybody buys into. Um, and we really feel it's really important that, and we talk about this with any new hire, we ask everyone, what is your, like, what's your impact portfolio, right? So some people have a deep impact portfolio, meaning that they've done a lot of work in the social environmental realm. Others won't have, but they maybe they do it in their volunteer time, uh, right? Or their sort of passion projects. And so one thing we do to kind of keep the culture strong is we have a code. And our code is driven by our purpose, which is to go to work every day to accelerate change in society. And our code, we have one core value of public, which is courage. And so it's the courage to stand up, the courage to stand out and to stand together to accelerate change in the world. And we built a whole code and a set of behaviors and attitudes around that. And so one of the things is that, you know, we, and I think we have an advantage here because we are a purpose-driven company, but everybody comes to public because they want to accelerate change in the world. And so that binds us already very tightly. Um, the other thing that we're working on, and it's a work in progress, is how do you really create a culture of real talk? Because what I find is, you know, I've worked in different cultures. Everybody brings their baggage into a culture. And I think part of that baggage is that they don't believe that it will be rewarded to be completely honest and to, and to confront, you know, real challenges, right? It's so easy to accept it and then have all the side talk and the, right? Um, and so we're really trying to uh, lead by lead by example, but have real talk all the time uh, with our team. And then we do other things, right? Like how do you do that internally? Uh, how we do it is uh, we like continuously talk about the need for real talk. And we so every Tuesday when we come together, we do uh, we do shout out. So we start with like. Uh, what do people appreciate about someone else in the company? So that's on the positive side, right? But you got to put like, you got to put the good coins in the, in the bank before you can do the negative stuff, right? The harder stuff. So because if people don't trust you and don't believe you're coming from a good place, they won't be open to the constructive criticism. So we actually do, we talk about shout outs. We do shout outs every week. And we also, with the code, talk about things that have happened over the past week that are a reflection of the code, good or bad. And then in one-on-ones, we're trying, and again, we have a, you know, we still have a, a road to, to, to drive on this one, but we try to do in constant feedback mode, and this is the real talk, what's working, what's not working, what would you do different? And so the more we can build the muscle of constant feedback of what works, what doesn't work, what would you change, you get to the real talk, right? You build that trust. Um, and so those things, if you think about having a code, you know, really celebrating the positive and shouting out in a positive way, right? Constant, you know, feedback on, on the work and what people are doing well and what less well, um, has, I think has built, you know, a pretty nice culture. We still have a way to go, but a pretty nice culture. And then we do all kinds of supports for people from our policies on top of us for our, you know, paternal and maternal leave to, um, you know, we have a week of volunteerism, paid volunteerism that we do for everybody. Like we have a whole bunch of things to really support our team as, as individuals, both outside and inside the office. But at the core, if you want to really build a great culture, it has to be in the work, right? It can't be all this stuff around. It has to be people loving, believing in the vision and the values of the company, wanting to do this kind of work, and then having a level of autonomy to do great work. Right. So that's, um, you know, and that's true for any company. You know, Phil, with you're saying you're, you have the open conversations, real talk, what's not yeah. working. What's something that someone said that said this isn't working and you had to go back and change it? Because listen, I mean, you take pride in your business and your company, even though you want to hear it, it hurts. It's like a yeah. punch in the stomach sometimes to hear those things. Yeah. What was one of those things that was maybe a punch in the stomach that you had to go back yeah. and with the team and look at? Yeah, I'll, I'll give you I'll give you a couple of really uh, quick ones that were pretty, uh, pretty important transformational for us. One has to do with uh, there were there was points uh, 
not that long ago where our team would tell us, we would do these sort of quarterly surveys and they, and they would tell us that they didn't feel that leadership had their back, which really, really hurt um, because we spent so much time thinking about the team. And I always say like, and if you ask anybody on the team at Public, we're only 40 people, but they will tell you like, I am super responsive to anybody on our team. And I say to them all the time, I said, well, why wouldn't I be? Like, we're just the sum of the people at this company. Like, <laughs> there's nobody more important than the people at Public. Um, but so that the fact that they felt that they didn't have their backs, like I gutted me. And so what I realized was we were doing a very, a poor job of communicating. We weren't bringing them along on the decisions we were making and we weren't doing it, um, well enough or often enough. So that was one where we had to really change how we communicated and, you know, so classic, right? I mean, we're marketers and communicators. I mean, you have to tell somebody something seven to 10 times before it sinks in. I mean, that is just true. You you tell somebody once and you think they're going to remember it, it doesn't happen. So, um, except in the rare exception. So what that was one. Um, I'll tell you another one was though that we we have a real commitment to having a diverse uh workforce at public. We've made really good strides, but we've had some real pushback around how are we, you know, are we retaining uh people of of color? Uh, and different ethnic backgrounds, and are we doing enough to attract them? And are we doing is our, our our approach to hiring good enough? And so, you know, we were guilty like many, where we were just hiring based on the networks of people we knew. Well, if you're predominantly white and middle class, guess what you're going to find? And so we had to change the way we we're doing it. It's still a work in progress because you know we're about to work with a, a, a DNI consultant to help us improve our. Um, employee attraction and retention uh, and really put that lens on it. So, you know, we got feedback from saying like, we're worried that we know you're committed to it um, and we've made great strides, but it's not good enough. Uh, and these are from some of the people in our company, people of color. And so that's really important. So, you know, there's, there's been a bunch like that. And um, I think when you can create the safety where people will really call out what's not working for them, it always makes your company better but you really have to be open to it. Um, and, and it can, it could hurt. Yeah, I could see that. I mean, if someone's like, we don't feel the leadership has our back and like, like that's our purpose is to make sure you know that. So you were mentioning communication, things had to change. Um, what were some of the things you did to alter the communication so people felt that? Yeah, so I, I would say two two core things. One is that, so we were getting this sort of pre-COVID and then COVID hits, right? One of the things that helped in this regard was, uh, like I think probably most companies, especially smaller companies, um, we were hell-bent on protecting our team. And I was also personally hell-bent on not making sure that they were whole from a financial perspective. But we were really transparent, transparent to say, listen, I mean, you know, when COVID hit in mid-March, uh, you know, so much of our business just dried up because people just put a freeze on everything. And, you know, so we said, look, our here's our intent is we don't want to let anybody go. And our also our intent is that we don't want to have to cut anyone's salaries, but we may have to, depending on what happens. And it'll start from, from me and everyone else, uh, leadership down. Um, we were seeing if we could get some government support. And if we said, if we can get the government support, we will not make the cuts. And that's exactly what we did. So through the entire, you know, height of the pandemic and, you know, basically since, since COVID hit, uh, we did not fire one person and we did not cut anyone's salary. So, you know, when you, when people are saying, do you have my back? That's a pretty clear indication you have their back. Cause we could have gotten the government subsidy and still cut people by 20%. Right. But we didn't, we didn't do that. Um, the second thing we did is we started to communicate way more often and, and with more, more depth to everything that was happening in the company and the decisions that we were making and doing it on a very regular basis and bringing a whole new level of transparency. And it was a bit of a hangover for me as we were growing because, you know, we're still a small boutique shop, 40, 40 people. But when we were like 10 people and 15 people, there was a closeness. But also, you know, if you share too much with your team, especially when you're just trying to like grow and you're not doing amazing and you're not very profitable, it can scare people that like, I might not have a job tomorrow. So I, I think I built, speaking personally, I think I built a bit of a defense mechanism 
the way you do for your children to protect them. And I don't mean to sound paternalistic at all, but just didn't want to worry them because I knew we could navigate it. As we've grown and we, you know, very luckily, knock on wood, we've had three fantastic years of, of growth. Um, what I realized was, especially with the pandemic, we need to get really good at being very transparent about everything that's happening in the company. On a quarterly basis, we share the results financially where we are. We talk, we set a plan for the year. We tell them where we are at the plan. What have we succeeded? What have we not succeeded? And we constantly reinforce and communicate. And I still think we have a we have a ways to go to be excellent at it. But that constant communication and that level of transparency has had a huge positive impact uh, on the company and the culture. Phil, first of all, thanks for sharing that. Um, I just want to be the first one to thank you. Thanks for sharing your journey. Thanks for sharing everything that you're working on. Um, I want to encourage people to check out publicinc.com, which you can see if you're watching the video, you can see it right here. They work with some and work with some amazing uh, companies and people. Um, you can see Johnson & Johnson here. You can see Converse and, and much more. So check it out. Check out more episodes of the podcast. And Phil, thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks, Great everyone. You. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. Like a beach if you find the sand right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand